And, um, my name is Sean Martin. I teach in the philosophy department, and I have the distinct privilege of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Michael Nagler. Um, I first met <laughs> Michael Nagler at a conference for the Concerned Philosophers for Peace uh, at Chico uh, some years ago. <laughs> uh, yes, there is such an organization. Um, uh, uh, and his comments at that conference made a significant mark on me and encouraged me to shift the focus of my own research. I'm a political philosopher, uh, but to focus on uh, the often uh, underemphasized and unrecognized uh, history and philosophy of nonviolence. Um, it's a very rich and dynamic field, and I'm so happy that I was turned on to that uh, by that conference, and in particular, Michael Nagler. Um, Michael Nagler is a respected scholar and voice for Gandhian nonviolence. Um, he's a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley where he founded the Peace and Conflict Study Program. And he's also the founder of the Meta Center for Nonviolence um, uh, here in Marin County. Uh, Petaluma. Petaluma, excuse me. <laughs> That's right. uh, Dr. Nagler is the author of The Search for a Nonviolent Future, which won the 2002 American Book Award and the Nonviolence Handbook, both of which have been translated into several languages. He's a frequent writer and speaker on nonviolence and related topics and facilitates workshops in meditation for the Blue Mountain Center for Meditation, uh, where he has lived at the community's ashram since 1970. Dr. Nagler's current work includes a major documentary film and a book on nonviolence and the new story. His recent scholarship through the Meta Center addresses the growing body of research on the science of nonviolence. Uh, I invited Michael Negler to come speak with us today because I believe his work is central to so many poignant issues we're facing today, and I'm really looking forward to what you have to say. Dr. Negler, thank you, and I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you so much, Professor Martin. Uh, uh, I also want to thank you for coming out today, given what is going on, on on this campus and the larger campus known as the United States of America. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, be brief enough to allow some time for some questions at the end. And when you ask me a question, assuming that I can hear you, I will repeat it so that it can be part of the recording. Uh, I just would like to add to Professor Martin's introduction that I'm extremely proud that the, your president and mine, I don't mean the one in Washington, I have no connection with that guy whatsoever, uh, but your president here at the JC, I actually had the great honor of uh, being his professor for a while at UC Berkeley. So I say that so that you should all be inclined to curry favor with me to have influence, undue influence over here. <laughs> Thank you, no, but Frank is, Frank is a very good friend and I've really enjoyed our relationship. So I want to wish you uh, a happy day after April Fool's Day, because I have the feeling, and you probably do, that just about every day is April Fool's Day these days. Uh, latest example among the recommendations for limiting uh, school shootings, maybe even getting rid of them, or arming teachers, which is, uh, like I could not imagine a worse idea. There's been already four serious episodes of uh, mishaps in that direction. And then, get this, if you haven't seen this before, all students should carry see-through backpacks. Yeah. So you could just tell, you know, what kind of sandwich they have for lunch and whether they've got a nine millimeter in there. Uh, and then uh, one superintendent of schools in Pennsylvania suggested that every classroom should have a bucket of rocks. Yeah. And <laughs> the shooter came in, you pick one of these nice rocks from some Pennsylvania river, and uh, you, you, if you throw it accurately enough, I guess you could actually intercept the bullet, like Wonder Woman. Uh, so, but to quote Edna Chavez, who is one of the very brilliant outspoken students that are uh, rising now uh, in response to this issue, all over the country, and uh, two weeks ago during the march, she said, it's time to get to the root causes of all this suffering, and we can do that by changing the conditions that foster violence and trauma. 
So that really is what I'm going to talk about. The title of my, the official title of my talk, Nonviolence and Human Destiny, is not a misnomer. We will get to that. But I'm mainly interested in figuring out the causes and the cures of violence. And in fact, I thought I would, would you like to come and take a seat? I thought I'd like to uh, take a leaf from the Compassionate Buddha's book and talk about the four noble truths of nonviolence. And they would be violence, the cause of violence, removing the cause for violence, and the noble five-point program for removing the cause of violence, which uh, we're going to get to very soon. So the first part, violence, unfortunately, I don't need to tell you a lot about it. It has become a kind of epidemic, and it's ruining uh, a vast number of lives. 289 students or other personnel have been killed or wounded since Columbine in 193 schools. But that now we know to take into account that there are 187,000 students who have survived those shootings. And we, we know that survival just means physical survival. It doesn't mean that you aren't marked, that you aren't traumatized. And incidentally, it turns out that one of the best uh, healing, best ways to heal from that kind of trauma is swinging into action. So I'm really, really glad that 800,000 students and others turned out on the 24th. And uh, Stephanie and I interviewed a couple of those students for our radio program, which is every other Friday out of uh, Point Reyes. And it uh, looks like we might be going to Dallas to have some training seminars with them. So this has been a busy time for Meta. Uh, so, but beyond all of that, all of us, every single person in this culture and throughout the world is affected by these events. They were, were affected in our very identity. I remember a question that Michael Moore posed suddenly in the middle of his film, Sicko. He said, who are we? Who are we that we could be doing this to one another? Now, uh, a reporter that, a journalist that I like very, very much, Bob Kohler, who writes out of Chicago, had a beautiful article recently uh, called Change is Coming. It's on his own website called Common Wonders. I want you to write down metacenter.org and then after it, Common Wonders, co-creating a culture of peace. And he put it just beautifully. I'm going to be quoting him several times. He said, violence in the United States of America is out of control. It has its claws around the lives of our own children. It is a terrifying symptom of a society built around fear of a political structure devoted to war. I don't think we need to say more about violence. But as far as the cause is concerned, now, what violence has a cause. I'm now going to draw inspiration from a very unlikely source. You didn't think that I would be quoting the NRA uh, here today. And it's not because when I was younger, much younger, I actually got a scholarship from the NRA because I'm such a good marksman, I guess. Uh, but as we know, the NRA has a slogan, which is guns don't kill people, people kill people. However, they use that slogan in a cynical way to draw your attention away from the fact that guns promote and uh, stimulate people killing people in a tremendous degree, which has been proven scientifically over and over again. And they're also drawing your attention away from the fact that yes, while people kill people, people also prevent people from killing others. Can we have the next slide? I don't know how many of you heard about, know about this beautiful person. This is uh, Antoinette Tuff. She was in a school in Decatur, Georgia, when a deranged young man off his meds walked into that school with an assault rifle. In this country, we want to make sure that deranged people have access to assault weapons. And a backpack with 500 rounds of ammunition and said, we're all going to die today. 
uh, and she kind of uh, swung into action. She said, uh, no, honey, it's going to be all right. I love you. We, we don't have to die. You have problems. I understand. I have problems, too. Do you want to hear about my divorce? They get into this conversation, and finally she says, well, sweetheart, put your gun down on the desk and lie down on the floor, and when you're ready, I'll call the police. So uh, in other words, we don't need to see into children's backpacks. We need to see into their minds. And I'd like to now talk about a uh, declaration that goes way back to 1986. It's called the Seville Statement on Violence. Could we have the next slide, please? Yeah. 1986, the theory of innate aggression, as it was called, was extremely popular. You saw popular books on it just flying off the shelf. People loved to hear that they were innately aggressive and there wasn't a thing you could do about it. However, scientists knew that this was bunk. In those days, science still had some prestige. And in 1986, 18 social scientists collected on Seville, in the city of Seville, and made this declaration. It is scientifically incorrect to say, I'm going to shorten this a little bit, it is scientifically incorrect to say that war cannot be ended because animals make war and because people are like animals. First of all, people's bodies are like animals. Our minds and our consciousness are of a different category altogether. Only in cartoons would you see a lecture hall like this with giraffes, right? <laughs> Only human beings can do this. It also turns out to be a gross exaggeration to say that animals make war. There are some recorded instances of bands of chimpanzees that have fought repeatedly over a piece of territory against one another, but war is not uh, a part of human nature, as the next declaration says. And the important addition to that is we can take responsibility for our own actions. Actually, this is the reason that people were so enthusiastic about the theory of innate aggression, that it enabled them to duck out of taking responsibility for their own actions. And this is one of the most beautiful things that the young people are saying now. This stops here. We have got to take responsibility. It's scientifically incorrect that violence can't be ended because people and animals who are violent are able to live better and have more children than others. That, of course, turns out to be pure fantasy. Anthropologists have found out a long time ago that even among this Yanomami, the rather aggressive uh, Amazonian people, they have a myth, they believe, that killers thrive better than non-killers. But if you look at the statistics, even in that kind of a context, they do not. Uh, it's scientifically incorrect to say that we have to be violent because of our brains. Could we have a look at the next slide before we come back to this? I don't know how, here's some brains. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about mirror neurons. Have you, would you raise your hand if you've heard about this? Okay, yeah, good. It's getting to be somewhat better known. Briefly, it turns out that when you see another person carrying out an action or when you see them expressing an emotion, the neurons, the nerve cells that would generate that same action or that same emotion in your brain they fire. The only reason that you don't go through the action is that there's a set of super mirror neurons that intervenes and says, no, that's Professor Nagler making that dramatic gesture up on the stage. That's not me. I don't have to raise my hand. So this was discovered in monkeys in Parma, Italy in 1988. And it has tremendous significance for nonviolence. and has led scientists to declare that we are, quote, wired for empathy. Now, I don't like that metaphor that we're wired for anything. I think if we're anything, we're wired for choice. But the fact is, 
we have inherited a nervous system that predisposes us to react empathically to others. And just to give you another scientific example, there was an experiment carried out uh, in Mexico about 20 years ago by a man named Grinberg Zilberbaum, typical Mexican name, uh, where they, uh, they took two people and put them in a room and had them meditate together for about 20 minutes, half an hour. They put them in separate rooms. One of those people was shown a flashing light and you had one of these uh, fMRI set up so you could see his brain or her brain responding to the flashes. Okay, so far nothing surprising, right? It's strobos the brain on stroboscopic uh, psychedelics. The other person's brain was doing exactly the same thing in synchrony with that person's brain. Apparently they had set up some kind of, what shall we call it? Uh, scientists tend to call it today subtle energy. It used to be called telepathy. They carry that experiment steps further. They put the two people in different buildings. They put them hundreds of miles away. Same deal. They even put one of those people in what they call a Faraday chamber, meaning a lead-lined room through which no electromagnetic radiation can be propagated. Therefore, you know, it, was, it must have been a terrible experience to be without cell phone communication for, <laughs> about, for the duration of the experiment. But guess what? It made no difference whatsoever on the people who had meditated together and brains were now empathic. So this is what Albert Einstein calls spooky action at a distance. And whatever you want to call it, subtle energy, telepathy, spooky action, the fact is we are tremendously in contact with one another. So this is a picture of those mirror neurons actually uh, firing out in, in paired brains. Uh, this, was, this is a computer generation of those brains. It's not like, like they took them out and you know, took a photograph. Okay, could we go back to the Seville Declaration for just a second? Uh, it's scientifically incorrect that war is caused by instinct. In fact, scientists don't even like to use the word instinct anymore uh, because it's, it's so obscure what they may or may not be. But the fact is that human beings have been around for several hundred thousand years, depending on you, where you want to draw the line. Uh, my daughter had a DNA screen. Incidentally, she was a nursing student here some years ago. She had her DNA screening uh, recently, and, and now she's uh, kind of making fun of her husband because she has less Neanderthal DNA <laughs> than he has. Uh, so we, depending on where you want to say, here's where modern humans begin, it's about 100, 150,000 years. And war becomes common practice uh, to where you'd even notice it only about 6,000 years ago. There are episodes that go back further, but even 6,000 years ago, there are whole civilizations that existed without a sign of war for thousands of years including some Native American groups. So the, the last line of a Seville statement before we move on, the most important question is why soldiers and politicians are trained and prepared that way in the first place. And so Meta has developed a rule of thumb, which is never degrade a human being. Do whatever you have to do you need security, have a security system. Whatever you feel you need to defend your country, defend it. But never do it by degrading another human being because that is going to compromise the long-term situation. So if we could go to the next slide and then the next after that, here's the conclusion. We conclude that we are not condemned to war and violence because of our biology. Instead, it is possible for us to end them we cannot do it by working alone, but only by working together. However, it makes a big difference whether or not each one of us believes that we can do it. Otherwise, we may not even try. And that is more or less the purpose of why I'm talking to you today and why we've done all of these books and why the Peace and Conflict Studies program existed is to sh help us believe that we can do it. So war was invented in ancient times and in the same way 
We can invent peace in our time, and it's up to each of us to do our part. I'm going to, the rest of my talk will be a comment on those last two statements. So if it's not in our genes, clearly uh, violence is part of our culture, and the reason we have more violence here today is because of the culture that we have here today. One of the most important uh, primatologists, I used to think primatologists were Catholic theologians, but n no, it means people who studied uh, our primate ancestors, chimpanzees, and now, of course, bonobos. Uh, one of the most important of these is Franz Duval. Uh, comes from Holland, and in 1979, he was in the uh, Arnhem Zoo. There was a society of chimpanzees. They got into a fight, which is not too uncommon with those creatures or certain other primate species. Uh, and then they started making up. You know, they were grooming each other, and they had a special noise that they make called pant hooting. It's not a very pleasant noise. It's kind of like, like here at football games sometimes. And uh, he said, that's interesting. I'm witnessing reconciliation. Uh, why don't I go and check the literature on this? So he went and checked the literature on reconciliation. Mind you, this is the day where uh, the literature on aggression is uh, bursting off the shelves. What's the literature on reconciliation? Anybody want to venture a guess what he found? Nothing. Zip. Nada. So he, he started a whole new field of research. Now he said, upon arrival from Europe about two decades ago, I was taken aback by the level of violence in the American media. I don't just mean the daily news. There are sitco in the sitcoms, in the comedies, drama series, and movies. Staying away from Schwarzenegger and Stallone doesn't do it. Almost any American movie features violence. And unfortunately, this leads, as he says, to desensitization. I get uh, the online uh, version of the New York Times, I, I confess for my many sins. I patronize it. And every now and then they have a feature called, uh, where they're interviewing a videographer, filmmaker. And you know, these people, they're all sort of, it, it's kind of amusing their attitude. Well, I wanted to create this feeling, and so I did that. And they go through all the technique of how they created all of these feelings. In the meantime, the film that they made is hideously violent. And they don't even mention it, and neither do any of the patrons, I'm pretty sure. So this actually creates a phenomenon which psychologists know as priming. They define it as a non-conscious form of human memory. And they say that there is a magic number. If you have primed with a certain idea for 10,000 hours, it seems, that idea becomes deeply embedded in our consciousness, and we tend to act on it without thinking about it. Acting without thinking is a pretty good description of what's taking place in political spheres uh, today. So 10,000 hours being the magic number to make what we would call in, in Indian philosophy a samskara, a deeply uh, embedded through repetition. Uh, I did the math. I'm terrible at math, but I did the math, and I figured out that by the time we're old enough to vote, 18 years old, we have seen, I wasn't looking at the violence in particular here, we have seen 219,000 hours of commercials. So we are deeply ingrained with the, what we used to call in comparative literature, the subtext or the embedded messages in commercials. So let's take a quick look at what some of those messages are. We go on to the next slide. <laughs> do, I, do I need to uh, comment on this? You know, the, 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 the deepest needs of our humanity are to be satisfied by buying external things. Okay, the next one. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not exactly encouraging our empathic responses here. 
Now a couple that are a little more subtle. One more slide. Uh, here's a, a very attractive, I almost said sexy, but okay, a very attractive guy in a very attractive uh, sports car. And you see these funny blips, top, next slide. The blips are his heartbeat and the engine RPM. And the point of the advertisement is to show you that they have become synchronized, like those uh, experiments that we saw with Grinberg and Zilberbaum. So one more on this poor fellow. I don't know if you can see the message here, but it's, let's see. Oops. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I didn't mean to do that at all. <laughs> OK. Uh, this must have a pointer somewhere, but I don't see how to use it. But you can see in white there it says, don't just drive the car, be the car. Now, Martin Luther King said, we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented civilization to a person-oriented civilization. Because this thing-oriented civilization, which makes us lose connection with our humanity, leads inevitably to violence. And Mahatma Gandhi said that his nonviolence project was doing exactly the same thing. Uh, we look at the next slide? Yeah. While this machine age aims at converting men into machines, I am aiming at reinstating man turned machine or woman turned machine to his original estate or condition. So let's move on now to uh, the cure for all of this. And show, take a look at the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, there was one more. <laughs> There was one more on the advertising. This it was a billboard that, that I photographed in Petaluma. We can see that one. Yeah, it was, our pain is your gain. I mean, the idea that he, if another person is suffering, it's you're being made happy. This is absolutely the core of a violent worldview. Okay, so on to the next one. Yes. Uh, Franz Duval in 1996 carried out a very interesting experiment. Uh, he had a colony of these rhesus monkeys, which I've called kind of tongue in cheek, bad primates. Rhesus monkeys are pretty darn aggressive. When they have fights, they don't even know how to reconcile. They go, they sulk for many hours. Hmm, I have people like that in my family, but never mind. Uh, so he had a colony of these rhesus monkeys. And we can take a look at the next slide. <laughs> I, I'm from New York, so I imagine that's what this guy is saying. But he also had, can we take the next one, please? And the one after that? Oh, I, I hope you're having an uh, empathic feeling of cuteness uh, here. These are stump tail monkeys. They are rather larger and well-built, but as a matter of fact, they have a very pacific culture. They reconcile easily, and uh, Duval thought, hmm, this is interesting. What if we put the stump tails in with the rhesus <laughs> and see what happens? So according to the standard model that we have in our minds of what the world is and how it works, the rhesus monkeys wiped up the floor of the cages with the stump tail monkeys because they are more aggressive. That is not what happened. Three amazing results uh, came from this experiment. First was uh, the rhesus monkeys were a little bit puzzled because uh, the stump tails were not using the advantage of their greater size. I kind of like that, you know, as having been small myself. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> They, so it looked first to the rhesus when they got over this, they weren't going to be attacked. They thought, if thinking is the right word for a rhesus monkey, they thought, uh, well, let's take advantage of these guys. And you'd go up to a stump tail sitting on a branch and start you know, nudging him out of the way, like, hey, you got some kind of problem, get out of here. And to their amazement, the stump tails would neither run away nor fight back. Does that sound a little bit 
familiar from human behavior. In some cases, the stump tails would actually say, look, you got a problem, huh? You're really angry. Uh, you must be a Republican or something. Well, look, uh, <laughs> here's my finger. Have a good bite. Ooh! And the rhesus would bite on the finger, which is about the most aggressive thing you could do without bringing in some friends. And the stump tail still would not go away. I like to imagine, because I like to imagine a lot of stuff, but I like to imagine that the pain being felt by the stump tail was actually registering somewhat in the minds of those rhesus monkeys. In fact, their mirror neurons are registering that. One of the astounding findings about mirror neurons is that when you inflict suffering on another person, like a torturer thinks that the other person is suffering and he isn't, but that's not true. That same experience is going on in his brain. So the first astounding thing is that the rhesus monkeys uh, were not able to push the stump tails over. And it gets better as it goes along. The second astounding thing was within a couple of months, the rhesus monkeys actually adopted stump tail culture. So they were all acting in that very pacific way. And the third uh, piece de resistance uh, after the experiment, uh, Duval had gotten and his colleagues got their research reports out of it. They took the stump tails out to watch and see how long it would take for the rhesus to regress to their back to their old ways. And guess what? They didn't. So peace culture is not only stronger in the short term, if you know how to carry it out, but it actually is robust. It's more enduring. Now, this is a model for us from our evolutionary background. But what do we need to do to change human culture? Obviously, not biting one another on the finger and so forth. It turns out, and people have been working on this now for quite a while, it turns out that every culture has what you might call a core narrative. There is a story in that culture. And the story in our prevailing culture is that the universe consists of material particles interacting randomly, period and that there is no particular drive discernible in evolution or in physical events. And above all, everything is separate. The universe is local. If I make a noise on this desk, it is not interacting with something else on the moon, right? Much less further away. Well, uh, this model, this paradigm of the material world supports a view of biology which is competitive and that supports a view of human culture which is competitive and then competitive people rise to the top and as uh, in Zorba the Greek uh, Anthony Quinn says the whole catastrophe comes from that. But uh, practically every detail of this story, every proposition in it is wrong. The universe does not consist of material particles. We've known that since so oh, about 1902. It was basically confirmed by 1936. Uh, I took physics at Cornell University in 1957. It was still just going rattling on, happily saying the universe consists of these material particles. Um, competition is not the dominant mode of development in evolution. Cooperation is. I had a colleague at Berkeley who said that if we, our genetic line, had not developed cooperation, we would be swinging from trees upside down. We'd be at the level of lemurs now. And finally, that competition and violence are not at all necessary in human behavior. So how do we go about changing this? Well, we can start individually, as the De Seville Declaration said. Jody Jackson is a partner at something called the Constructive Journalism Project. That might be also a nice thing for you to jot down, because by the time you're finished with this talk, you're never going to want to read another newspaper, I hope. Uh, and she made a deliberate attempt. She was getting very depressed, made a deliberate attempt to change her media diet 
And she says, my worldview changed when I changed my media diet. So uh, it, another word for a worldview is a paradigm. Another word for it, for the turning of one, the old paradigm turning into the new paradigm is called the great turning. And that phrase was, is now associated mainly with my friend Joanna Macy. And she said there are three things going on that uh, help us at this point to bring about the great turning. These are three things that are going for us. First, there's the fact of chaotic breakdown going on all over the place, which we experience <coughs> as a kind of profound demoralization. Uh, a colleague of mine in psychology has invented a concept called perpetration induced <coughs> traumatic stress, perpetration-induced traumatic stress, PITS, where she was able to document that combat soldiers, executioners, and uh, even, unfortunately, abortion providers are traumatized by their work. And as you know, uh, American service people, men and women, are today committing suicide at the rate of 20 a day. And if you ask them why, they will say, I lost my soul in Iraq. I don't know who I am anymore. What they're expressing is now a better term for PITS, which is in terms of reaching the public, is moral injury. So one thing uh, is that this is intolerable. We just can't stand this anymore. We are looking around to get out of it. Uh, another great advantage is the recent discovery, it needs to go much further, of what we call the wisdom tradition, because the greatest teachers of humanity have always said life is a whole, it's one. As uh, scientists say, this is a non-local universe, not an uh, isolated separate <coughs> universe. We are not separated from one another. Uh, but this is almost not taught in our institutions, the wisdom tradition, certainly not taught as such. And the third thing that uh, Joanna Macy cites is the tremendous developments in new science. I've all talked about a, a couple of them. I'd like to show another slide now. This is, uh, I want to introduce you to Sacco. Sacco is a peacekeeping chimp. What happens is uh, when an alpha male chimpanzee gets too old, to be the alpha male anymore. Uh, he has what's called a Jimmy Carter moment. Remember, Jimmy Carter woke up one morning when he wasn't the president anymore and said, what am I going to do with all my energy, and decided he would go into conflict resolution. Well, uh, Sacco and others like him, they become peacekeepers. So if a fight breaks out between, let's say, two male chimps, Sacco will get in between them and you know, make himself a little larger and uh, be, you know, say, say, come on, you know, stop it. He's not threatening to attack, but he's saying, come on, get out of this. And it turns out that these chimpanzees are absolutely critical for the thriving of the community. If you take them out, the community starts to look like Chicago or Parkland or Newtown, Connecticut. So next slide, please. Here we are uh, with some much more advanced primates. He's uh, uh, Derek Andres, whom I, whom I met in New York, and uh, Derek Oakley and Andres Gutierrez. They were with an organization called Nonviolent Peace Force, which work, we work very closely with. And they were in the Sudan. And they were in a uh, nonviolent, I'm sorry, in a displaced person camp, a UN displaced person camp. And uh, you know, the mandate of the UN is to surround the camp and offer security, but not use, their, not use their weapons. So suddenly, a group of milit a militia burst into the camp, heavily armed, uh, aiming to massacre people. Uh, Derek and Andres went into a small building there to get out of sight. Uh, and in, within minutes, the militia burst into that building. They saw, here's Derek and Andres with four women and nine children huddling there for protection. And the militia, seeing that they were not 
Sudanese, and that they have these uniforms, sort of, as you can see, said, you get out of here. Uh, you know perfectly well what's going to happen the minute they're outside of that hut. Incidentally, this attack lasted for 20 minutes and 60 people were massacred in that 20 minutes. But to the astonishment of the militia, Derek and Andres, you know, they glanced at one another, they knew what to do, they'd been well trained. They took those badges that you can see hanging around their neck and showed the badges and said, I'm sorry, we are international protection officers and we're not leaving. At which point, the militia turned around and backed out of the hut. And not only that, that happened three times. So once again, we're finding that a trained human being is capable of uh, deterring, deflecting a great deal of violence. Now, uh, I want to add one point, as I've already mentioned, to Joanna Macy's list of three things that are going for us. Uh, the wisdom tradition, science, and the sheer suffering that's involved in going the wrong way. I want to add a fourth thing, which is nonviolence. It's a critical addition. Uh, for one thing, we have never heard of a case of moral injury by somebody being nonviolent to somebody else. Uh, I interviewed D Derek in New York, and he was not traumatized by the courageous act that he carried out. He was rather proud of himself, but he said not, he was a little too modest to mention it, but you could tell. Uh, and Gandhi said that the carrying this out gave him, quote, a joy that he had no power to describe. In fact is, he said, that nonviolence is the law of our being. And that's why we critically need it today to carry out a gentle transition from the old story to a new story. Because this, in, al in alignment with what Martin Luther King and Gandhi both said, we need to repersonalize our worldview and focus again on the human being. To understand a human being, the most critical thing that we need to understand is, in fact, that we are capable of nonviolence. We're capable of learning it, we're capable of offering it, and we're capable of responding to it when it's offered to us. Fortunately, nonviolence is growing at rapidly all over the world. There are new institutions like Nonviolent Peace Force is an example of an organization that's part of what's called unarmed civilian peacekeeping or unarmed civilian protection. There's an organization dedicated to capturing the best practices of successful nonviolent uprisings and communicating them to other uprisings around the world. So you had some of these people from Serbia were in Tahrir Square in Egypt, helping them to, to do it right, which is basically what Meta is in business for. We, we say that what we're doing is helping people practice nonviolence more safely and more effectively. Uh, I can't go into all of the other reasons that nonviolence is growing so successfully, but because I'd like to finally end by uh, saying, OK, what is this five-point program that I was talking about, and how can we play our personal role in making this transition happen, which is where the human destiny part of our story comes in. So next slide, please. I like these guys, too, but I'd like to see the next slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have developed uh, something called uh, the Roadmap, which is a tool to help organizations become more coordinated, more uh, cooperative with one another, which is, the, I see it as the only thing standing between us and a complete nonviolent revolution. The fact is that forces uh, that rely on violence are very well organized, the forces that rely on nonviolence, for, partly for understandable reasons, are not. The other thing that this diagram tries to do is to uh, give you a trajectory from, it's a kind of centripetal move from person power, where you, personal empowerment to constructive program to resistance. And very often, 
When we get involved in a struggle, we go about this backwards. We start with resistance without paying any attention to our own personal development and without trying to look for constructive ways to solve the problem first. Anyone who has adopted a nonviolent worldview, even a little bit, will believe that there is a win-win solution for every single disagreement, every single dispute, every single conflict. If you know when to do what, you can reach an agreement that's satisfactory to everyone. Once you understand human nature well enough to know what people really want. So finally, let's look at the core of all of this, as I've been saying. Could you see the next slide? Watch this. Uh, <laughs> That person power circle, we have, here's the five steps that I mentioned in the beginning. The very first, which is the one which usually loses our audience completely. <laughs> here's where our popularity sinks, if it could go any lower. Uh, avoid the mass media. I mean, obviously, what we mean is use a lot of discretion. Be aware, resensitize yourself in Duval's terms. Be aware of the impact of violent imagery and don't expose yourself to it because you think, oh, I'm above this, it's not affecting me. But you remember that priming phenomenon, it is affecting us on a level that we're not aware of. It's making us more alienated from who we really are and more alienated from one another. So if you have no way of uh, avoiding all the violence on the mass media, violence and the vulgarity without avoiding the media altogether, just avoid it altogether. They'll give you plenty of time to study and f do other things like, for example, learn nonviolence. There's a, a bibliography, there are courses, there are programs. It has now become a full-fledged science. As Kenneth Boulding used to say, if you can give a test in a subject, then it is real. And as President Chong will tell you, I have been able to give tests in nonviolence. And actually, uh, in recent years, since you were in my course, there are fantastic uh, scholarly discoveries that have been made about the effectiveness of nonviolence. We should all be familiar with that. Uh, we do recommend that people take up a spiritual practice. Do you remember Antoinette Tuff? She actually had a grounding practice that she was doing every day, and that kicked in. That was her priming. That kicked in the minute this young man walked in with the assault rifle. Now, if you do all of these three things, you know, stop watching action movies, uh, take nonviolence courses, read about it, come to the Meta Center, and uh, start meditating regularly, you'll be a pretty nice person. So, why not take advantage of that and try to reverse the depersonalization that's been imposed on us by our culture, by our civilization, and just try to interact more personally with everyone. I had a friend once in the old days who had something called telephones. We, now, we call them landlines today. He had trouble with his phone, went down to um, Pacific Bell, and the person at the front desk said, go sit at that chair over there. Someone will help you. So uh, pick up the phone and dial this number, and a person will help you. So he picked up the phone. He dialed the number, having this conversation. Very nice conversation, but there's a strange echo I mean, behind him. So he, he turned around. There's the guy on the other end of the phone who was sitting at the same desk. But God forbid that they should look at one another and communicate as human beings when you had technology that you could interpose. And that was then. I mean, just imagine what you've got now. And finally, uh, whenever you're getting involved in social change actions with individuals, with groups, take the opportunity to tell the new story. People say, you know, why are you doing this? Because we are all parts of one another. Because nonviolence is a more successful solution. So uh, assimilate some, your own version of the new story. And now the last slide will give you one of our recent versions. The five points that are probably pretty critical are that we are primarily spiritual beings through mind, body, and spirit. And therefore, we are deeply interconnected. Therefore, we have untold inner resources. 
And those resources include the capacity for nonviolence, and finally, that we can take charge of our own destiny. We are not the product of our genes, our hormones, and with a little bit of work, we won't be the product of commercial advertising either. Well, thank you very much. I really have appreciated your attention, and I think I've left just enough time for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, something you kept came, coming back to, Michael, that I think is just so important, uh, and it started with your story, your anecdote about Jamal and uh, his alarm at finding virtually no literature uh, covering reconciliation. And I think we've been uh, uh, going through a, a pretty long period where there's been a dearth of information on other yeah. scientific matters as well. And yeah. uh, you must be familiar with uh, Stefan and Chenoweth's uh, great oh, yeah. book, Why Civil Resistance Work. Yeah. I mean, there's a growing body of evidence that can respond to this question. Yeah, yeah nonviolence is great, but does it work, right? Yeah. Uh, and now the evidence is becoming pretty profound. But I, I guess my question, I, I, I'm sorry, this is becoming something of a comment. Um, you talk about the problem of the self-fulfilling prophecy. You get locked into the story where we think human nature is such that nonviolence is impossible yeah. and that um, we look for information of a counter-narrative and we mm -hmm. don't find it, like the mm -hmm. wall. And, uh, and this, it, this creates a confirmation bias loop. We then only find information that confirms the narrative yeah. we already have bought into. And this is facilitated by the fact that we just don't feel responsible then. Oh, yeah. what can we do? Nature, yeah. instinct, right? Yeah. So uh, what I do a lot of with, with my students, whether it's critical thinking, I try to expose our underlying assumptions, like yeah. this, this, this old story. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, how do you, what do you find to be, uh, you mentioned some great examples, disconnecting from the information, developing a spiritual practice and so forth. Are there any specific uh, techniques or strategies that you find especially useful in kind of breaking people out of that cycle, that vicious mm -hmm. cycle of having an assumption that is reinforced by the narrative and mm -hmm. refusing to look into alternatives. Yeah, thank you. So now, as you know, I have to try to repeat your question. That's uh, kind of right. that. a long and without, question. Without the commentary where your question was, what are the ways, and that is absolutely the critical question, what are the ways that we can break out of that worldview, uh, given that there's such a dearth of information around us, and assimilate for ourselves, I'm putting this into my own words if I may, assimilate for ourselves this new story and the new worldview. I think it's, again, a kind of question of priming. If we start looking for it, we see it. If you know what to look for, or a little bit of information is very helpful here. If you know what to look for, you start seeing nonviolence everywhere. In fact, as Gandhi said, civilization wouldn't have survived for as long as it had without nonviolence being the primary mode. The fact is, well, take a look, take this example of Antoinette Tuff, for example. There was actually one news network that wouldn't t run her story because, quote, Nobody got killed. That was the one story we needed to hear. All the other stories about how many people got killed are not teaching us anything by way of giving us a way out of it. So you kind of tune your radar to picking up. Uh, one of my favorite little examples, I was once on a bus going from Berkeley over to San Francisco. There were two young ladies in front of me and. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop. I was actually <laughs> trying to meditate, but it, it did break through on me that they were talking about their boyfriends, no big surprise there. And one of them said, I don't know why things go better when I'm nicer to the creep. They just do. <laughs> so I came away, th I, I didn't intervene on their conversation, but I came away thinking if you knew why, it would help to reinforce that impression, and you could build up a whole narrative out of it if you knew about empathy and cooperation and all these things. So just to be on the lookout for it 
is very helpful. I mean, personally, I have a meditation practice, as you probably would not be astounded to hear at this point. And I find that that is like the most powerful single mechanism because it gives me a little bit of detachment from my mind, whatever it's thinking. And then I can use my own judgment in looking for what to fill my mind with. Yes, question. Well, Ron Artest, the uh, late, uh, what team was he on? Detroit. Detroit. He, he became Meta World Peace. And the end of his story is we went down to LA and interviewed him and uh, actually have a bit of a film of him talking about nonviolence. It's one of the many projects that Meta hasn't been able to really carry out completely. Stephanie, do you want to say something? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Meta World Peace's uh, story, Stephanie is reminding me, does illustrate something which is pretty encouraging in a way, where uh, Gandhi said, I can make a satyagrahi, a nonviolent person, out of a violent person. I cannot make one out of a coward. So we need violence. We need, let me be very careful here. We need the capacity for violence and anger in order to be nonviolent. And we have so much of it going on that I think we can see there's a lot of raw material in our culture right now. We don't have to be demoralized by the amount of violence. We have to look for a way to transform it. Just one quick question before we get to your question, just very quickly. Both Gandhi and Martin Luther King discovered this secret. Uh, in King's terms, we expressed anger under discipline for maximum effect. That's what he did with his anger. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the comment was, I shouldn't have made a snide remark about Republicans. Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> uh, you know, the way nonviolence works, uh, a famous model of Barbara Deming is that nonviolence has two hands. You know, I will not put up with your injustice, but I am open to you as a human being. So I was talking about their injustice, not about their humanity. Okay. Yeah? Um, how often do you meditate and how often would you recommend that to um, How often do I meditate, which I will not answer that question, and how often do I recommend for people to get started? It uh, depends somewhat on the technique that you're using. What we use uh, is called passage meditation, and uh, there's a website of course, bmcm.org, stands for Blue Mountain Center of Meditation.org. And in that system, we memorize uh, lengthy passages that have an inspirational content, of course, because we don't want to prime ourselves to be worse than we are. And we, we start off by meditating half an hour every morning. Yeah. And people often say, hey, you know, this is working. I want to do more. We say, yeah, but don't lengthen that half hour right away please, because uh, you can get into trouble with this stuff. So instead, do half an hour in the evening. Yes, sir. The, yeah. 
Yeah, the question is about police brutality and whether we can do something about it. Uh, actually, I shared a platform with a police lieutenant from Petaluma when we went to Petaluma High School on the 24th. And uh, actually, there is a, a man who's developed a program. His name is Mandar Apte, where he takes groups of police officers to India, exposes them to nonviolent culture, and brings them back. And he'll, he, he's been quite successful, and his next gig is with the LAPD. He's going to show his film at the Paramount Theater. So, yeah, they are in a, police are in a very tough, stressful situation. They have to make instantaneous decisions. They're scared to death. At the same time, they are primed to use violence to defend themselves, and so they often do it when it wasn't necessary. So are you on... Okay, I guess I guess we have time for another question or two. Uh, you had a question, yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming you're familiar with the shooting that occurred in South Carolina. I believe it was in the church. The black church. Yes, nine people were killed in that church. Um, the people in that church embraced the man that walked in. And yeah. They told him that they loved him, they supported him, and he went on to slaughter. So what would you say when my mom finally stepped forward? Uh, he, Yeah. This is one of a number of examples of peop formerly violent people who have become extremely remorseful when they encounter forgiveness. Uh, one of uh, the, uh, the example have being the nine people, uh, the, pe the congregation in South Carolina where nine people were shot, and that was a racist <laughs> shooting. Um, Forgiveness does have, when, but you know, forgiveness has to be somewhat deeper than just going up and shaking a person's hand and saying, you know, I forgive you. There needs to be a really internal re renunciation of one's anger. And there's no question that when you can make a conversion like that in your own mind, it has a powerful effect on others. Now, this doesn't always mean this. We have to be careful here. It doesn't always mean the others are going to respond right away to where you see it. Sometimes they're so deeply ingrained and they're so troubled that they won't react on the surface. But when I said never degrade a human being, the flip side of that is always ennoble yourself and others. And it always does work. Uh, I mean, I've, I've known any number of Vietnam veterans who've been overcome by remorse for what they did and gone back to Vietnam, often encountered forgiveness and understanding and uh, come away with le uh, lessening their own burden of guilt, but very often coming away dedicated to helping to make the world so this will not happen anymore. So I hope that's an answer to your question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the question is uh, what in, does the Meta Center in particular do for people who have been acculturated so badly to help them? Aside from meditation. Yeah, aside from meditation. Stephanie? Yeah, there, there is a, a much a becoming quite popular technology now called ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
The only problem uh, with ACE is they're starting to find out that we've all had adverse childhood experiences. Okay. Um, well, I think we should uh, conclude at this point. They probably need this hall for something else. Sean? I, I just couldn't help but follow up on something, and I know it's something you could say more eloquently, but no. when the question comes up, well, why didn't nonviolence work in that moment? Uh, you know, how do you account for it? And I think the right question is a comparative one. Well, why doesn't violence always work? And yeah. When, and so any kind of meaningful judgment of whether nonviolence works or not requires fundamentally a fair point of comparison, because obviously yeah. violence doesn't always work yeah. either, and maybe worse. <laughs> yeah, one, of, one of my colleagues at Santa Cruz uh, put it this way, people try nonviolence for a week, and when it doesn't work, quote unquote, they go back to violence, which hasn't worked for centuries. <laughs> Yeah, often this is when I said being, knowing what to look for is very helpful and making that comparison. You know, we, uh, in the 20 years or so that we've been practicing an armed civilian peacekeeping, not one person has been killed who is actually on the job. Uh, how many people have been killed using military technologies in the last 20 years? You know, it's in the millions. Okay, well, again, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Coming.